Please welcome to the stage Daniel Russell of the Asia Society Policy Institute and the Honorable B. Kim Shao of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office. Hi, everybody. Please join me in welcoming Representative B. Kim Shao, who's the head of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office here in the United States. B. Kim and I have known each other for a while. She served as an elected representative in Taiwan, was on the National Security Council of Taiwan as an advisor uh, to the president before coming here. And uh, she's been serving in uh, Washington for almost three years now, I think. So, became welcome. We've just heard your president talk about values, about uh, daunting challenges, uh, talking about partners. You know a thing or two about all of those things, and particularly about partners. And I'm interested in your take on the U.S.-Taiwan relationship, just for starters. And I ask in part because I had a service uh, in my career mm -hmm. handling Asia policy in the White House and at the State Department. I dealt on, with the Taiwan issues. I dealt with Taiwan. And we have a unique, uh, utterly unique relationship that's mm -hmm. not formally uh, diplomatic. It's not full recognition. And yet it is values-based. It's, it's very close. Uh, and it's also very pragmatic. Mm -hmm. So what, what's your experience been and what's your take on the relationship? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Danny, for the introduction, and it's uh, great to be here uh, at Concordia. And um, you know, you're, you're right, the Taiwan-U.S. relationship, you use the word unique. It is indeed one of a kind. It's officially unofficial, uh, with a legal framework enshrined in domestic American law uh, passed in 1979. Um, the legal framework for the relationship has been pretty much consistent over different administrations uh, in the last four and a half decades. Uh, but the substance of the relationship has developed and grown um, over uh, the period of time in which Taiwan has evolved to also become a full-fledged and robust democracy and where our shared values and interests um, are becoming stronger as well. So around D.C., the key phrase used to describe the relationship is rock solid. Um, and um, I, I do believe that those shared values and interests, some of them described by the president, um, our shared values in democracy, our belief in freedom, in market-based economies, um, our shared interests in security, prosperity, and peace and stability uh, in the region are what uh, continues to fuel the very strong, rock-solid relationship that we have today. Well, I can certainly attest from the U.S. policy side that, first and foremost, there's immense admiration and support for the incredible political transformation that uh, Taiwan has engineered uh, in its successful quest for democracy. And, and the ability of people in Taiwan to uh, continue and sustain an open and a democratic society is very important to the U.S. government. It's very important to many of uh, Taiwan's uh, neighbors and uh, the rest of the world. Taiwan's uh, economic contributions are not uh, insignificant. You're a major trading partner. And of course, as your president mentioned, the role that Taiwan plays as a hub, as the center of advanced semiconductor technology is utterly critical. I think from the perspective of the U.S. Uh, policymaker, though, the, the critical vector which you and the president also mentioned is the security and the stability of the Taiwan Strait. And the game, one of the key goals of US policy is to ensure that there are no unilateral changes made uh, to that status quo without prejudice to what the people on the mainland and the people on Taiwan might decide uh, that force and coercion uh, not be used. Well, you use the key phrase, um, another key phrase we hear a lot in Washington, and that is the status quo. Um, actually, the, um, Taiwan is very committed to the status quo. Um, it may not be um, the ideal um, hope and dream of all the major actors uh, in our geostrategic space, uh, but the status quo is the um, greatest common denominator 
um, that ensures a continuing stability and peace in the region, uh, which has over the last few decades uh, also fostered uh, enormous uh, economic uh, prosperity, uh, growth and progress. So we are keen in working with our partners, of course, mainly the United States, as well as others in the commu international community, um, as well as uh, open to dialogue with um, our counterparts across the Taiwan Strait to ensure that the status quo is preserved uh, in a way uh, that continues to benefit um, the interests of the people uh, in our region. Uh, but I also want to make the point that the status quo not only benefits, it's not just a local issue. Um, as the president uh, has, has said in her uh, recorded remarks just now, um, peace in the Taiwan Strait is a matter of global prosperity too and indispensable uh, to continuing economic growth uh, in the world. And uh, any disruptions in the stability of the region uh, will also have global consequences. And that's why it's paramount that um, everyone who has a stake in continuing uh, stability uh, must also work with us to deter any possibility of disruptions to the peaceful status quo. Well, BKM, I want to come back to both the security issues that you've touched on, but also the sort of broader regional and international mm -hmm, yes. questions of uh, where and how Taiwan fits in. But I don't want to leave the U.S.-Taiwan mm -hmm. uh, relationship uh, quite yet. Um, status quo doesn't mean everything is frozen and immobile. It mm -hmm. means uh, an equilibrium based on some commitments and based on some uh, key values that are unchanging. Mm -hmm. Taiwan is growing, Taiwan is evolving, and the U.S.-Taiwan relationship also is growing along with it. What, is, what are some of the things that you've seen? How do you think the relationship has developed mm -hmm. in the time you've been here? Well, um, Danny, in our various capacities over the past many years, uh, we've uh, tried to work to preserve this status quo, knowing, as you said, uh, that the equilibrium is constantly facing all kinds of pushes and pulls in different directions. Um, and you know, from Taiwan's perspective, uh, we are facing a set of hybrid challenges uh, to keeping that equilibrium. And that does include uh, military coercion. Um, it does include also um, constant uh, attacks in the cyberspace, uh, very proactive political warfare, um, disinformation, um, and other tools of uh, political coercion. Uh, it also includes economic coercion, uh, where uh, the normal rules of uh, a regular trade and market economy uh, are constantly disrupted uh, for the purpose of uh, coercing sectors of our society. But we're also seeing economic coercion being played out in the international scale, uh, coercing others um, in, our, in our region and in our neighborhood. So I, I think as we are facing you know, constant pushes and pulls uh, in this relationship, uh, ultimately we also need to push back on these challenges and potential disruptions to the status quo. Um, so it, you're, you're right, it's not a static situation. It requires a lot of work. Uh, it requires uh, taking very cautious and pragmatic steps um, every step of the way. Uh, it also requires good coordination uh, internationally to ensure that the shared interests uh, in keeping that um, stability of the region is uh, continuously preserved. And um, it, it's, it's not easy. You know, we are uh, working in, in all kinds of um, complicated political contexts that we need to constantly balance. And in the context of the Taiwan-US relationship, um, you know, one, one aspect which you know, we are greatly appreciative of is, is the uh, relative unity of bipartisan support uh, for Taiwan uh, in DC. And um, we need to ensure that Taiwan doesn't become an, an issue of uh, domestic political competition in the United States or even in Taiwan. That you know, the shared interests, those shared values and interests that, that guide the broader relationship um, continue to guide a very stable, predictable, um, and uh, safe environment in which we can all continue to operate. Well, I certainly agree. Um, and you're absolutely right about the uh, convergence of, of views uh, between the, the two parties in the United States. But um, back to the push and the pull, as you described it, and also the issue of, of pushing back. So 
in terms of the equilibrium, there's a pretty fundamental mismatch between what Beijing uh, sees as the optimal outcome of Cross Strait, the, the Taiwan mainland uh, tensions, and what the people on Taiwan want. And the US policy consistently has been to not try to weigh in, not to take a position on what the ultimate disposition ought to be of what began as a civil war, but to insist that any resolution, first and foremost, needs to be peaceful. And second, that it has to be acceptable to the 23, 24 million people on Taiwan. It can't be imposed by force. I think it's fair to say that the people on Taiwan are pretty determined to uh, sustain an open and a free society. They've worked so hard to build their democratic traditions and institutions, and the U.S. and many other countries have a stake in that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, uh, Beijing, the People's Republic of China, is adamant that Taiwan is a part of China, that there must be unification, and that uh, failure to make headway to, towards unification is unacceptable, just standing still isn't mm -hmm. good enough. These are the kind of irreconcilable tensions. Mm -hmm. What is Taiwan doing to push back against coercive pressure? What is Taiwan doing to try to uh, sustain the status quo in dealing with Beijing? Um, well, I, I, I think, you know, I describe the status quo as the greatest common denominator um, because it, it is clear that all parts in this geopolitical uh, environment uh, may have different hopes and dreams and ideal uh, scenarios for the future, but uh, ultimately uh, we do have that shared interest in, in keeping uh, the situation stable. Um, and, and you're right, um, you know, the PRC certainly has a different view of where the cross-strait relationship should eventually evolve. Uh, for the people of Taiwan, um, Hong Kong is a tragic reminder that we need to do more to preserve the freedoms and uh, the democratic system that we have worked so hard uh, to build. And so, uh, you know, ultimately, uh, we, uh, again, with a very pragmatic approach, uh, have to, um, work to constantly refine our uh, democracy in a way that we are resilient to coercion. Uh, we are more resilient in the face of um, multiple hybrid challenges, as I had described. Um, and some of the things we are doing um, on the security and military side, of course, is to um, enhance our ability to deter um, any contemplation of a military solution uh, to the differences across the Taiwan Strait. Um, and there are three layers of that, including building our own defenses, uh, investing in, in uh, more asymmetric uh, capabilities. Uh, we have no interest in engaging in an arms race across the strait, uh, but we need to be smart and asymmetric uh, in our approach. A second layer involves continuing to consolidate, uh, deepen the partnership with the United States. And a third uh, area in, involves a, a joint international interest in um, in, in ensuring uh, the status quo is preserved and, and that that particular interest is implemented through uh, whether it's uh, regional uh, de defense but also through economic uh, diplomacy and uh, other means of engagement um, in, in our region. Um, on the economic side, uh, we also seek to strengthen our economy, make it more resilient in face of all kinds of uh, economic tools of coercion. Uh, by diversifying our economy, engaging with other um, important um, trading partners. And uh, as of the end of last year, Taiwan was the eighth largest trading partner of the United States, although we are a relatively small population. Uh, we uh, have worked to deepen that by um, engaging in trade negotiations. Uh, we just signed a very meaningful uh, trade agreement as part of our uh, uh, US-Taiwan trade initiative. Uh, we are also working on tax agreements, other infrastructure that will further incentivize and facilitate uh, deeper economic ties. And we certainly hope that in the interest of preserving stable, secure supply chains, 
um, enabling these very uh, positive, proactive contributions to the global economy um, that other partners around the world will also be open uh, to engaging in these trade and um, um, economic uh, discussions and creating the relevant frameworks uh, for that. Um, we are also working on building more resilience uh, in our uh, domestic uh, um, political context. And um, like many other countries around the world, we are facing a, a flow of constant uh, cyber attacks and um, political cognitive uh, warfare uh, through uh, various modern platforms such as social media um, and um, traditional media, of course. But um, we, we have to you know, constantly be innovative. And um, the best tool we have is our open democracy, uh, where it's not just an effort of the government. Uh, it is a, a whole of society effort. And, and this is our approach uh, to, to, to our national security. And that is, it is indeed a whole of society effort um, and with multiple components, because we are indeed uh, in a hybrid um, challenge situation. So, you know, there's a security military dimension, but, you know, complementing and supplementing that are also the, the economic resilience that's needed, the societal resilience, um, also the cyber resilience, the uh, democracy, you know, the, the value of our open democracy and that environment of freedom where the people, our uh, public, also has the space for true innovation in finding the best and most effective uh, creative tools to counter um, the uh, political and cognitive uh, challenges to our democratic system. Well, you made a lot of interesting points, but in particular, what I think is very telling is you're underscoring the fact that there is a lot more uh, in play across the Taiwan Strait than just a bunch of uh, mainland Chinese PLA aircraft um, flying uh, missions and, and naval ships. That there is, yes, there is military pressure, but there are other forms of coercive behavior, what uh, elsewhere we've called gray zone sort of activities that pose real challenges to, uh, to Taiwan and Taiwan's economy and Taiwan's society, and that you're uh, focused very much on building the resilience to uh, withstand that. Um, when I was in the U.S. government, we worked on something called uh, the uh, the GCTF. Sorry to use an acronym, the uh, Global Cooperation and Training Framework, that really showcased and uh, facilitated Taiwan's own contributions to the region, whether it was in programs for education and women's empowerment or technology, or it was a um, disaster relief, those sorts of things. Um, let's talk just a, for a moment about Taiwan and the international community, because I think that just like there's an asymmetric defense, there's asymmetric diplomacy, where the value of Taiwan is high enough that other countries are prepared to tell the PRC, we have a stake in this issue. Mm -hmm. Well, um, the irony of being here in New York uh, during UNGA um, and the the, the fact that Taiwan continues to be unfairly excluded uh, from inst international institutions like the United Nations, I think does um, demonstrate um, the challenge, one of the key challenges that we face, and that is um, the uh, un unreasonable and unfair um, effort to um, isolate Taiwan. And again, it requires a lot of innovation and creativity uh, to break through that a political isolation. Um, I think the world uh, just went through um, a, 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 a tragic event of the COVID-19 pandemic. And this again does demonstrate that no one should be left behind, that you, know, you can't put political exclusion boundaries over uh, a virus. Uh, you can't you know, you, you can't exclude important partners uh, from the process of building global resilience against such global um, level challenges. 
And uh, Taiwan does seek to be a force for good. Uh, we have tried over and over again uh, to contribute to the World Health Organization with our expertise uh, and our experiences. Uh, we've also sought to benefit uh, from the expertise of everyone out there uh, in the global community um, in partnership. And so, um, you know, in, in, in light of, of the uh, very difficult situation um, of our international existence, um, we do appreciate creative uh, efforts such as the GCTF to build um, platforms, um, creative platforms with the NGOs, with other governments uh, who are supportive of our meaningful participation. And on this, the G7 foreign minister's statement uh, lately has also acknowledged and highlighted the need to be more supportive of Taiwan's uh, meaningful participation, as uh, have other uh, leaders around the world. And this is something we will continue to strive for. Great. Well, Lee Kim, the world benefits greatly from what Taiwan has uh, to offer and does in fact provide. Uh, so regardless of the uh, formal diplomatic status, uh, Taiwan plays a, a big and outsized role in, uh, in regional uh, growth, in regional stability, and in international security. So thank you. Thank and you. please join me in thanking Representative Beef Kim Shaw.